My guest today is Steve Nelson. Steve is a Redmond, Washington-based CPA who writes about tax policy and tax strategies at his blog, Evergreen Small Business. He's the best-selling author of QuickBooks for Dummies and also Quicken for Dummies, and has written numerous other books about small business accounting and finance. He's also an adjunct tax professor at Golden Gate University in San Francisco, and he's been featured as an expert on small business accounting and finance in the Wall Street Journal, CNN, and the Seattle Times, among other publications. Super thrilled to have Steve on the podcast today. I've been a big fan of his blog for a long time and have learned a lot about tax from it. Uh, I invited Steve today to talk about the Section 199A tax deduction, which was part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed and went into effect in 2018. Now, this was a very consequential new tax provision that affects business owners, real estate investors, any type of contractor. And over the past couple of years, additional guiding regulations and a lot more clarity has emerged on how the deduction works. So I invited Steve to come share some nuggets of wisdom on this with us today. Steve, thanks so much for joining us to share insights and tips about Section 199A. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. I'd love to start just by learning a little bit more about your background. You know, how did you get into advising small businesses on tax and accounting matters? I, I, I guess I got into my accounting undergraduate degree just because I was interested in business. And one of the things that my accounting uh, professors had, had told me, sort of a secret, uh, was that small business was exciting profitable, a lot of really interesting things happening there. And so I just got, I just got kind of hooked. And, and I, um, I, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I, I went over to the uh, University of Washington MBA program and, and from there started at a very large public accounting firm, but eventually pretty quickly moved back to serving small businesses and having my own firm. Great. So you have one of the clearest, easiest to understand blogs that I've come across on tax updates and strategies. Uh, I guess for fun, what is your secret for writing such easy to understand posts and communicating arguably dry but financially important topics in a, a simple, clear way, given the tax code itself can be really convoluted? Yeah, I thank you for saying that. That may be giving me too much credit, but I think one of the things you want to do is, is really show a lot of respect for the reader and um, make sure you really understand this stuff um, b before you start writing about it. Some of it is, is very hard for me to learn and I can spend uh, days or weeks trying to learn really how something works and then uh, trying to figure out how to describe it in a way that makes sense uh, to the taxpayer who's gonna have to you know, follow these accounting rules. So mostly I think it's just taking the time and, and showing respect for the reader. Okay, perfect. Um, so we'd love to dive into 199A, but first just start out with some basics. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that went into effect in 2018 introduced this new tax deduction under 199A. So before we get into some of the finer grain details, just to orient folks, what is Section 199A and how does it work at a high level? Well, it, this, this almost doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, you know follow any sort of logic, but essentially what Congress decided to do, because they were giving a break to big corporations, they decided that what they would do is say, if you're a small business or a real estate investor, that you got a break too. And that break roughly goes like this. You just don't have to pay income taxes on the last 20% you make so uh, in, in the business. And so just to make the math easy, if you make $100,000 in your business, they're not gonna tax you on 100,000, they're only gonna tax you on 80,000. Got it. Well, uh, definitely wanna dive into some of the, sort of the, the rules and, and uh, constraints around this. But um, first, the, the, the income that gets um, this sort of tax break is, um, as you've written about on your blog, qualified business income. What is considered qualified business income like what's included and excluded yeah that's a that's a that's a, a key question and 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 a little bit confusing but but um the the the, the general rule goes like this uh, it's not uh income from a c corporation a traditional big corporation um but it's and it's not investment income um you know interest on a bond or uh um you know dividends on on a stock um, but what it, boy, I'm sorry about my light there, but what, what it is is almost everything else. So the profit that a sole proprietor makes, that's qualified business income. The rental income that a real estate investor uh, earns, that's qualified business income. The, um, the, 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 the what's called distributive share, the profit share that an S corporation or a partnership allocates to its owner, 
that's qualified business income. And then there also are um, uh, basically the 199A deductions available for REITs and for publicly traded partnerships. And there are even some special categories like agricultural and horticultural cooperatives that may generate 199 um, tax deductions for, for, uh, for beneficiaries or for uh, owners too. So we're not talking about W-2 income here for sure. No, and that's a good point is that the, one of the mistakes you have is, um, is, is that there is um, like things like W-2 income that a S corporation, a uh, small business owner might pay to him or herself, but that's not QBI. And also guaranteed payments that a partnership makes to a working partner, that's not QBI. So one of the tricks here is to understand what QBI is, qualified business income, and make sure that it's as big a number as possible on your tax return. Got it. On the partnership income, it sounds like um, the guaranteed, so salary-like partnership payments are not uh, considered QBI, but an equity-like uh, partnership, like a, a profit share, for example, that would be considered. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. And if, if somebody's familiar with the way a K-1 works, the very first box on the K-1 that has a dollar amount in it, that is, Q, that is QBI. That's qualified business income. Okay, great. So what are the, the most crucial restrictions or rules and constraints that folks should know about when it comes to claiming this deduction? Well, maybe maybe a place to start is that if you, if you have a, um, an income that is below the phase-out thresholds, <laughs> Uh, it, you're, you're, uh, they, they give you a lot of flexibility and they don't restrict you in any way. And so what that means is that if you're single and, you're, uh, and your taxable income is below 163300 this is in 2020, or um, married and your income is below um, 326600 they, they just give it to you. They give you 20%. But once you rise above that level, some rules start to click in. And, and one of the rules is is that if you're earning this income in what's called a specified service trader business, which would be, um, uh, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, a consultant, um, an investment advisor, um, professional athlete, a celebrity, then they're not going to let you use it. Um, you're going to, they're going to. There's a phase out range, but basically, eventually, you lose the ability. And then the other thing is is if you make over those thresholds I mentioned, what they want to do, what Congress wanted to do is they're okay with people using that deduction, but they expect something in return. And what they expect in return is you provide employment to workers at, uh, you know, earning a living in the US. And so they have a requirement that if they're gonna give you um, a, a, a you know, $20,000 um, uh, qualified business income deduction, they want you to have paid at least $40,000 to American workers. So that, so those are the two things. And actually those two um, restrictions, one based on wages and one based on um, somebody uh, not being in a specified service trader business operate uh, together. And, and I guess the other thing I would say is that unfortunately it's even a little more complicated than that because real estate investors don't need wages with real estate investors, it will actually um, look at wages and also the, the, the investment you've made in, in the property. Got it. So I wanna double click on some of those things. So specified service trader business, is this a, an explicitly enumerated, enumerated list or is there a test? Well, no, that's a good point. There, there is a list and, and I would say that if you think you might be in a category where you're specified service trader business, you, you actually literally want, this is kind of foreign, but I think you want to go into the final regulations and read the, 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 the small paragraph that describes whether um, what you, the field you're in counts as a specified service trader business. And, and there, there are a couple things that are worthwhile noting about that. And one is that Tax law uses definitions of specified service trader businesses that are not the same as, as you might use if you're in the business. And, and one example there would be, you might, you might be a physician and you might think that what you do in your, in your clinical practice or your surgical practice counts as medical services and so is therefore, therefore a specified service trader business, but it may actually not be a specified service trader business. Um, and so you might, you might, if you're a physician doing physician -y things, think that 199A doesn't work for you, but in fact, it may work for you. And another category that um, is really misused uh, by taxpayers is consultants. A consultant is in the final regulations language, something very specific. It's someone who provides advice or counsel 
or someone who does political lobbying. And but a lot of people who are, um, you know, contract programmers or, or developers call themselves consultants, but tax law uses a very precise uh, definition. So that's something really to be really to be cautious of. And we see a lot of mistakes that taxpayers and I'm sorry to say that some tax accountants make where they don't really uh, map what somebody's role is to what the, the final regulations say counts as a specified service trade or business. Got it. So it sounds like for somebody who's unsure, they would have to read the relevant part of the regulation and it will be, uh, it's like, a, it's pretty clear, almost in a binary way, whether you fit. It's not like an evaluative test that you would ask yourselves a series, ask yourself a series of questions to determine whether you're an SSTV. Is that right? Yeah, I think in most cases that'll be the, that'll be true. And just to use another example, a celebrity um, or a, is a, um, a or performing artist is considered a, a specified service trader business, and um, somebody who. Uh, but but it's very clear what what sort of fees count as or trigger specified service trader business. I guess the one thing I would say is that is that in some categories and physicians are one of these categories that it, what, what the final regulations say is that you're a specified service trader business if you provide medical services. But what you need to do is if you're gonna read that and you're a physician is you, you need to know what tax law considers medical services because it's different than what you as a, as a physician will consider medical services. There's not like the, the classic example is cosmetic surgery is not a medical service. So somebody who does cosmetic surgery may not be a specified service trader business, even though clearly they would think of themselves as providing medical services. And would therefore in that case potentially be able to avail the dedu deduction. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, that, 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 that would be a, that would be a quite, um, that would be a, a you know, a tax position that a tax accountant and a taxpayer would want to take carefully. And I think it's something that they would want to disclose on a return as and, and document their rationale. But yeah, I think that's the case. I think if you're a, if you're a, um, the, the, the rule, by, by the way, for medical services is that medical services are things that lead to valid medical deductions on Schedule A. But it turns out that by terms of the statute, cosmetic surgery is not a, a medical deduction. And so therefore, circularity there is that it's probably uh, not a medical service if you're providing certain kinds of cosmetic surgery stuff. It, it depends. You have to look at the rules. But yeah, those are those can be some big numbers and some big errors if people aren't on top of that. Got it. Okay. In terms of the phase out, so as I was um, um, both reading posts you've written about this as well as um, hearing your explanation, there's really sounds like there's three uh, discrete like buckets that uh, a taxpayer may fall into uh, for purposes of 199A. One is like they're entirely under the threshold where the phase out even begins. The second is they're in the middle between the where the phase out begins and where the phase out ends. And then the third is when they're above where the phase out even ends. And uh, I think some of those are clear. So if you're below the starting point, uh, you're, you're, you basically can take the deduction without much restriction. And uh, my, my question was, um, you mentioned for like business owners and for real estate investors, uh, once you start exceeding these numbers, um, Congress wants something in return, like job creation, et cetera. Uh, does that kick in in the middle bucket or only after you bust above the end of the phase out? No, that's a great question. So, so if, we, if we look at the phase out range for, for, for just a single person where, where it's in 2020, these are indexed for inflation as noted earlier, but in 2020, uh, uh, once you start moving above a taxable income of 163,300, um, and let's assume it's not a specified service trader business, Congress has a rule, and the rule is we care about the wages your business pays. And so, as you as you at 163,300, they don't care if you have, have wages, but at 213,300. Uh, 213,300, they they're going to say, well, you get the lesser of of either 20% of your qualified business income or 50% of your wages. And then what they do is you move from 163 and some change to 213 and some change. They sort of phase in that requirement to have wages. So um, if, if you, uh, here's a way to think about it. If you happen to find yourself at the exact midpoint between those two um, uh, ancient uh, endpoints of the range, you would, and you had no wages, you would lose half of your 199A deduction. You wouldn't get 20%. You would only get, you would only get um, 10%. 
Right. What would it be if you were in the, the dead center of that range, but you, you could uh, fully max, if you were, you were fortunate enough to be able to fully max out your 199A deduction just on the strength of the wages alone, would that mean that you would get the full deduction even though you're- Yeah, you will, get the full, you will get the full deduction. So as long as you will get the full deduction. Um, and so you'll, uh, yeah, if, you, if, if, you're not, if you're not constrained by your wages or limited by your wages, you're going to get, um, yeah, and you're, and you're sitting at you know, $25,000 into that $50,000 range, you're going to get um, your full deduction. Got it. And then once you're above the, the upper end of that threshold, then it's no longer about your, your QBI. It sounds like it's really just about the, um, the, the 50% of uh, wages or... Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't do a good job there. Once, once, once you're above the limit, what happens is, um, like, like to say, say you make a million dollars, just to make the math easy. Well, your, your, your QBI deduction is going to be 20% of a million dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars, but 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 there's a little check on the formula that says, but to, but to get that two hundred thousand dollars, your business needs to have paid at least four hundred thousand dollars in wages. Oh, I see. I I gotcha. So that that you could still even up above the upper uh, the second threshold uh, after the phase out, you could still get the full deduction, but subject to that check. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what happens is is it is it is that you as you move from um, you know, through that phase range, the wages become more and more and more essential. And finally, at the top and beyond, you got to have your, your wages, your deduction will, will, will be um, um, not greater than, uh, well, it, it'll be the, the lesser of 20% of your QBI or 50% of your wages. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, I understand that there's an additional rule around you get the lower of 199A or 20% of your taxable ordinary income. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, how, what, how that works. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's an important thing to keep an eye on. So just, just to make um, the math easy, you might have um, $150,000 of, of qualified business income, but if you have $50,000 of deductions, your taxable income might, might be only, quote, um, hundred thousand dollars. So your 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 QBI is going to be the lesser of either, or your, I'm sorry, your QBI deduction is going to be the lesser of twenty percent of the hundred and fifty thousand dollars of a business income you have, or twenty percent of the hundred thousand dollars of taxable income that you have, which would which would be less. You know, one number it's thirty thousand, one number it's twenty thousand. So that that suggests that in some cases, what what you want to do is you want to um, think about paradoxically you want to think about um, letting your taxable income creep up because it'll it'll allow you to take a bigger qbi deduction some uh investment advisors and i, I think jeffrey levine who's a well-known cpa and and investment advisor and uh, writer has pointed out that a person might want to think about not using their 401k and instead use a roth 401k because that will mean they have a higher taxable income and that might mean they get a bigger qbi deduction Gotcha. That does make sense. So effectively, you get the benefits of the, the Roth because it's tax-free thereafter, but you might still get some deductions. Sort of you kind of get a little bit of the benefits of, uh, of a traditional 401k, but you're just doing it through the 199A vehicle. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I'm just, so I'm, I'm just trying to understand, like if I, let's say I have a W-2 job, but I also have a side hustle and you know, that side hustle is doing pretty well. And that side hustle is like actually a legit small business that I could take a QBI deduction. Does that mean that, that I, as a taxpayer, am now having to do two analyses? I have to do an analysis on my side hustle QBI, and then I have to do an analysis on my job W-2 income to figure out which is the lower my taxable income from the job or my QBI before I know the number I can take? No, or because... In, in that situation, if you have someone who just to, just to make the math easy has a hundred thousand dollar W two and a hundred thousand um, uh, dollar side hustle or whatever, what what what's going to happen is um, they're going to get they're going to get a um, a QBI deduction tentatively equal to twenty percent of the hundred thousand dollars they make in their side hustle, and that's the way it'll work. And then and then the question is um, if their side hustle if their side hustle business has no wages and they're above the threshold, they may lose part of their deduction because they don't have 
because they don't have wages in their side hustle. So that's the situation where, um, you know, if that was if that was a married couple, say two hundred thousand dollars is is going to be below the threshold where they begin to lose wages or where they begin to lose the deduction. But if you were a single person, you would have lost a lot of your QBI deduction because you'd be so close to the top of the um, phase out range, that middle bucket you were talking about. Well, let's say they were married. So I, I guess to set aside for the moment the complexity of the phase out range, if that didn't apply, then um, am I doing two analyses, one on my W-2 and the other on my uh, side business? No, it'll, it'll be easy. In, in that case, what will happen is you're just going to get, um, you say you got $100,000 W-2 income, $100,000 side hustle income. Um, you're just going to get 20% of the side hustle income. So you're going to get a $20,000 QBI deduction. And you're not going to have to worry about W-2 wages there. I see. So what does it mean then, I guess, the, the constraint that says you would get the lower of the two? How, I, well, where exactly does it kick in? Well, so, so, so good question. And just to make, just to make this easiest is that, that the, the, the wages become important once you begin as a single person to have a taxable income of more than about 163, or once you're a married couple and you have a taxable income of more than 326. And so as you, as you, as you raise above that, you, you, you quickly ramp up to a level where uh, at, and sorry to give you these numbers out here, but but at 213 or at um, f at 426, you get the lesser of 20% of your QBI or 50% of your wages. I see. I see. Okay. I I, th I thought there was some rule. I, I could have sworn that there was some rule that you're there's a, a almost like a third check, which is that you get the lower of your 199 199A deduction or 20% of your taxable ordinary income. Yeah. Well, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do. That's that's gonna that's gonna. So your QBI deduction is gonna be the lesser of um, the. You're right. The, your QBI deduction is gonna be twenty percent of your QBI, not but not greater than fifty percent of your wages. And you also can't take a QBI deduction that's more than twenty percent of your taxable income. You're right. I see, correct, sir. So so it, back to my example of the. 100K side hustle and 100K W-2 income married couple, they're below the married joint filing phase out range where the phase out range even begins. Does that mean that they're having to compare 20% of their taxable income against their whatever their 199A deduction ended up being and taking the lower of the two numbers? Yes, but 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 it it turns out probably not to be much of a problem because like mm -hmm. let's let's think about this and just keep really round numbers. So say we've got a, a couple of say and 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 one person has a W two with a hundred k on it and the other person has a side hustler or their or their principal hustle and they make a hundred. So what they would get is they would get twenty percent of um of the of the one hundred or they or twenty percent of their taxable income. But what might be a common scenario is. What their tax, they've got $50,000 of deductions. So they would get the lesser of 20%. So again, we got $100,000 W-2, $100,000 side hustle, and $50,000 deductions. So their taxable income is 150. Um, and so they're gonna get the lesser of 20% of 150 or 20% of 100. I think the thing that shows up is that if you have a W-2 um, in a couple or in a household uh, on a tax return, you're going to, um, the, the, the W-2 is going to mean that your taxable income is above your QBI because you're, another way to say the same thing, your tax deductions are probably not going to be bigger than your W-2. I see. Makes sense. Okay, great. Um, so the 199A really applies to, you know, as I mentioned before, small business owners, um, uh, maybe partners in a partnership, uh, contractors. But most people work in jobs as W-2 employees. Why, why don't employees just call themselves contractors or sole proprietors to take advantage of this? Like what provision or what part of 199A ex like prevents them from claiming the QBI deduction if they just went ahead and did that? Well, you know, good question. And, um, and, and in fact, I think the early version of the, of the law led people to believe that you might be able to get QBI um, deduction on your wages. Um, and, and they fixed that in, in the regulations. And then the other thing they've said is that if you have been an employee 
And then, you know, somebody waves a magic wand and, and now you're quote a partner or you're quote a contractor. That's gotta, that's gotta, um, that's gotta be a real deal. And in the case of sort of a former employee becoming a partner, it's gotta be something that's pretty standard in your industry. Um, you, you can't just, you know, misclassify people. And if you were an employee uh, and now you're an independent contractor, that is, that's viewed probably, um, or the, the pr presumption is you're, that's not QBI income. You've just misclassified the employee. So the regulations should prevent you from doing that. Got it. Okay, great. Are there any sort of general rules of thumb or heuristics that are tips or strategies that you would advise taxpayers to keep in mind in order to, you know, other things being equal, maximize their potential 199A deduction? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, first of all, we, and we hit, it, hit on this at the very start of our conversation, you really want to do things to maximize your QBI, um, your, your qualified business income. And there are a lot of partnership returns that um, mistakenly classify distributions to partners as guaranteed payments when really they're just distributions. And those partnership returns that have been prepared incorrectly, it used to not matter. But with 199A, uh, those incorrectly prepared partnership returns um, destroy the 199A deduction. So, so you got to make sure the returns are done well and that you're not doing things to damage or understate your QBI. And then the other thing to remember is that these phase out rules kick in um, based on your taxable income essentially. And so, it, you know, people have assumed something like a doctor or a lawyer or an investment banker or whatever making $500,000 a year she or he doesn't get the QBI deduction, and that's potentially true. But if that person is married to a spouse who is a real estate professional and who on paper loses $200,000, it doesn't matter that they make $500,000 in their um, specified service trader business. Once the spouse on paper loses money, it pushes them below the threshold. And they, and they, they won't, in that case, there's an example where they won't get 20% of the $500,000 of QBI, but they'll get 20% of maybe the $300,000 of taxable income. But so those opportunities need to be need to be you know need to be carefully watched because it's easy to miss this and uh, operate you know with with some ignorance that means you lose out on a huge huge tax savings. Yeah, those are good tips. Are there any other things that folks should keep in mind? Um, you know, we talked about the one that you really want to make sure that you're that you're not unfairly labeling yourself a specified service trader business. Um, you, you want to be sure that if you um, you know if you if you have a very successful sole proprietorship, um, and and you're making an income that would mean you need wages, even a one person business should often um, operate as an S corporation just purely to get wages. No, just to make the math crazy. If you were some you know high powered a uh, real estate uh, broker and you're making a million dollars a year, I'm just being crazy there. Um, you're, you're not, you're not going to get a, a section 199A deduction, but if you, if you reform your business as an S corporation and pay yourself, um, the right number would be $280,000. You're, you're going to, you're going to get $140,000, um, uh, QBI deduction. So even though you've only really just bifurcated your, your, your million dollars of profit into wages and distributive share, and, and it's kind of playing a shell game, you're able to, by creating almost, you know, sort of somewhat imaginary wages, get yourself a 199A deduction. Got it. And in that case, you would get it because you're, you're actually getting to 50% of, of wages. Yeah. If you, yeah, if instead of paying yourself a million dollar sole proprietorship profit, if you reform that as an S corporation, pay yourself two, four, 280 of wages and 720 of, of, of distributive share of qualified business income, you would get 20% of 720, which would be um, 144 or 50% of 280, which would be 140. And so that would be the optimal number. Got it. Okay. So it sounds like you've used this example before. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the really numbers are, good. yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about how 199A interacts with retirement planning. So I know you've written some posts in the past about how 199A can alter the cost benefit analysis for retirement planning uh, when it comes to, and you even alluded to this a few moments ago, when it comes to contributing pre-tax money to a 401k or an IRA, um, uh, or doing it to a, a Roth 401k, for example, or maybe doing a Roth conversion. Can you talk a little bit about how 199A can change retirement planning considerations? And like what type of taxpayer should be thinking carefully about the interaction between 
these two things? Like what are the markers of that taxpayer? Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. And I, I would point people to, to consider three issues as they, um, as they sort of think about 199A in the context of retirement planning. And one is, is that if you are limited, um, if your 199A deduction is limited because of your taxable income, you, you, as noted earlier, you may want to think about um, not doing a traditional IRA or not doing a traditional 401k and instead doing a Roth version because that will bump up your taxable income in, and, and that will bump up your QBI deduction. So that would be one thing to think about. Another thing to think about is that, um, and this is you know kind of the same thing, but a little bit different, is that if you're somebody who, I'm just gonna use a round number here, but you're somebody who's got a, who's got a $40,000 tax deduction on your return due to QBI, and, um, and you know, you can just put that deduction on your return and you can, you can you know, save 10 or 15 grand in tax or whatever, and that's, that's good. And you can use that money to you know, do, do whatever you wanna do with it. But, but one of the things I, I've suggested to people, we've got historically low tax rates and maybe what you should do if you've got a $40,000 kind of bonus deduction on your return, maybe you should, you know, in, a, in essence, do the mental accounting, use that to kind of shelter a $40,000 Roth conversion. That you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna sort of use your deduction strategically to, to move money from a taxable or for, to a, from a tax deferred account to a Roth account. I think that's worth people thinking about. And then I guess the other thing I think is, is, is a little bit, um, you know, thought provoking is to think about whether this changes your asset location decision. You know, the, the, uh, qualified dividends, if you have taxable money, qualified dividends and long-term capital gains are the most favorably treated, um, uh, uh, you know, taxable income. But, but if you're only paying tax on 80% of the REIT dividends or 80% of your rental property, the, the, that, you know, that's, that's pretty close. That's pretty attractive too. And so I think if somebody did have an interest in real estate or wanted to have a, an allocation to their REIT, it would, it's not crazy to think about doing that in a taxable account. It's, it's you know, it, it would be, it, it's not clear. It's, it's not like you should put it in a taxable account, but it's less crazy than it used to be given that you're only going to pay tax on 80% of that real estate income. Yeah. So what, uh, how would you, I guess, what's the best course of action that somebody who is maybe contemplating uh, their asset location, this decision for them to get further clarity on that? Is it, I mean, without becoming a CPA themselves? Yeah. It, well, well, yeah. I, yeah I, I guess I would say that, that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a hardcore Roth fanatic. I, I think that they're often overused. Um, but but you know, I, th I think your first your first money should be in um, should be in your tax deferred account, and I think your bonds and your um, should be in your tax deferred account, and 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 then if you are going to have a taxable component, I think you should have you know in my sort of uh, um, philosophy or the thing I ascribe to is I would I would I would have uh, index stock and equity index funds in my taxable account, and then if and then if I still had more money and I wanted to, that I needed to invest, I would consider doing real estate or, cons, uh, well, I would definitely do direct real estate in a taxable account, but I would consider doing REITs in a taxable account too if I, if I had more space in my taxable area and I, and I hadn't filled it up with, with, with uh, say, stock equity index funds. All right, wonderful. I'd love to talk a little bit about real estate investors in particular. What are some of the 199A issues and considerations that uh, rental property owners and investors should know about? And in particular, I wonder if you could speak to two different personas. One, uh, uh, the first one being sort of the casual real estate investor who may own multiple properties, but they have still have a full-time day job and they're not like real estate professionals in the eyes of the IRS. Yeah, so, um... I, I guess the first thing I would say, and I know that um, you've been alert to the safe harbor issue with the 199A, but but my feeling is that 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 okay. So the, the safe harbor rule. Well, let me back up and say this: that in order to in order to use 199A, the activity needs to rise to the level of a trade or business. And one of the questions is: is if you've got a rental or two or three or whatever, does that rise to the level of a trade or business? It needs to to allow you to escape. Um, to tax on that last 20% of the income you make. And so that's the question. Lots, lots and lots of confusion about that from taxpayers. 
And, um, you know, those of us who were trying to figure this out were, were, you know, scratching our heads what they meant. And what they came up with was, um, was sort of a couple of rules. And one of the rules is, is that there was a safe harbor that if you could accumulate or people working on your property accumulated 250 hours, then that was going to be enough. And I think th those of us who were sort of grizzled tax practitioners thought that was nonsense. And what, and what I think most of us would say is that forget about the safe harbor. What you want to do is qualify under the what's called the Section 162 standard, which you know does your activity rise to the level of a trader business? And that has three requirements. One is that you're motivated by profit, um, which which clearly, if you're out buying rentals um, to to build your wealth and prepare for retirement, of course you're motivated by profit. You know, if, if you accidentally were were renting a bedroom to a to your nephew or something like that, that's not profit motivated. But if you're seriously out buying rentals, profit motivated, and then you need to be involved in the activity with continuity and with regularity. So I, I think that that you know I, I did a some analysis of this uh, of, of probably a couple of years ago where we looked at the court cases that the the IRS and tax court and federal courts had said rose to the level of a trader business. And it was very easy to qualify. You know, if you're doing something a dozen times a year, if, if you're engaging in it year in, year out, there are a lot of cases where just because you're small doesn't mean you're not serious about it. So I, I think you get, um, I think you get 199A on your, on your, on th those small real estate portfolios. I think that's very clear. So that's one thing to think about. And then the other thing that's a little bit of a wrinkle here is those, those phase out levels that we've, you know, sort of unfortunately had to discuss a couple of times here that they apply to real estate investors too, but the real estate investor rule works a little differently. There, what it says is that the, the QBI deduction either equals 20% of your, the, the lesser of 20% of your QBI or 25% of your wages plus 2.5% of the purchase price of the building. And so you have to be a little bit alert that if you get your income real high, you're, you, it's not a completely wage-based thing, but they're gonna look at the value of the building. So just to make this easy, if you have no wages and you have a million dollar apartment, um, your maximum QBI deduction is gonna be $25,000, 2.5% of a million dollars. Got it. So it sounds like you don't need the 250 hours if you have that continuity and regularity and profit motivation. That is enough to claim QBI on, even if you only have a handful of properties, you're, you're kind of a, a casual real estate investor. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think that is, I think that is, um, I think that is absolutely clear. And I, I would, I mean, you know, I, I think the, the sort of person who's going to have trouble, um, and, and this is going to court cases, but the sort of person who's going to have trouble as a rental investor is, uh, I'm just making this up now, but kind of, kind of cloning previous court cases. Somebody who was a college professor and went to Europe to do a sabbatical or teach a course in the summer, and for three months they rented their house. Well, that's not a trader business. Or somebody who, you know, they, they, um, for some reason, they had a spouse transferred, and and they're gonna so they're gonna leave town for six months, and they find themselves an accidental landlord for for nine months. That's not a trader business. But if you've got a rental property that's part of your retirement plan, uh, or two of them, for goodness sakes, that absolutely um, is gonna rise to a Section 162 trader business. You do, you do not need to show very much regularity or continuity, but it needs to not be something. You know, it's got to be a real business. It, but, but I think a lot of people are gonna qualify for it. So that would, I think what I'm interpreting from that is that even a single property owner, as long as they intended it to be for, like you said, retirement purposes, et cetera, that even that would qualify. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. Again, you, you, and you said them again, just a minute, Grandier, I said, you know, are they profit motive, profit, profit motivated? Clearly they are, you know, is there continuity there? Well, if they're renting it year in, year out, absolutely. And is there, is there, is there regularity in their activity that, you know, they're, they're, they're collecting a rent check every month and they're regularly getting over there to check on the property. And, and as much as they don't like it, they're occasionally over there doing repairs. They, they're profit motivated, profit motivated. They have continuity. They show regularity. They meet the section 162 standard. And that would be true. Even if there might be a period of months that go by when they're not engaged in the business because actually the rental's operating smoothly. There are no problems with the tenants, et cetera. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I guess the, the thing I would say is if you had a small um, consulting business where just to make the math really, really small, you were just doing a little bit of consulting and you made $5,000 a year, 
um, you're going to qualify as Section 162, even though your profit is five thousand dollars, even though it's just a just a you know couple of weeks of of, of, of uh, 1099 contract work you do or whatever. And so that this is going to work the same way. You don't. This is this was designed to be something for small businesses and for for small real estate investors. And so I think you're going to get there with very low um, very low um, threshold or whatever. And I think I know the answer to this, but I just would love to kind of hear you say it. Um, if I'm house hacking, like I live in a multifamily property, uh, living in one unit and renting out the others, that also should qualify. Just because I live there doesn't take away from the fact that I'm treating the other units as profit motivated and no. and right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So if I mean, you say if you had a duplex and one is your house and one is your rental, clearly, I mean that that's almost the fact that you're living next door is going to show continuity because you're not just doing this on the willy nilly or whatever. And if you had a fourplex and you're living in one and renting three or triplex, same deal. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Um, how as a taxpayer, how do I document this? Because, I mean. I, I don't, I don't recall ever filling out a form that's saying, you know, yes, co continuous and regular, yes, profit motivation, but I could get au audited. And if I say, if I'm doing my taxes myself with TurboTax, how does TurboTax know this? Yeah. So, um, y you know, the, the, the safe harbor rules, which I'm encouraging people to sort of discard as useless, um, they have some record keeping requirements and you'd probably want to keep some sort of near contemporaneous log um, which is awkward because you, you needed to have a log from before the, they even required the safe harbor. And so they have some rules about that, that you don't need the contemporaneous log before the safe harbor rule existed. But I think your profit motive continuity and regularity thing, I don't think you need to have much documentation for that as long as you can, you know, pass the giggle test. I mean, again, if this is some deal where you were, you know, renting something to your nephew, renting an extra bedroom to your nephew, or you were, you know, you were an accidental landlord for a few months, those things are not going to work. But if you're, if you're buying rental properties and working on them and, and it's part of your wealth plan, I, I just think that is, um, I don't, I, I think just the, the, the essential facts of the, of the situation are going to support you taking the QBI deduction. You, you meet that section 162 standard of um, your activity rises to the level of a trader business. If I was doing my own taxes, uh, though, how would I con convey that to TurboTax? Because I, uh, I don't think TurboTax asks, are you a 162 trader business? They try to infer that based on a, a survey, a questionnaire that they walk you through, right? Yeah, so I, you know, I don't, I don't know TurboTax because we're, because I don't see it very often because we're using industrial strength, strength software for this. But, but in, in, in the professional software, what you do is you, you mark, um, you mark the each rental or you mark your rentals as being qualified business income. And there must be, there must be a box you can check to indicate that it's qualified business income. And so I would, I would look for that. Got it. Okay, great. If you are looking to the safe harbor because you qualify, like if you have more than, I don't know, half a dozen properties, it's very conceivable. You might be spending 250 hours a year through your, you know, you and your agents, like contractors, et cetera. Um, in terms of record keeping requirements, it sounds like there is some, you mentioned this contemporaneous logs. What format does that take? Is that just me putting lines in Excel or is that some? Yeah, I think, that's what you'd want. I think that's what you'd want to do. And because I, 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 I'm sort of, you know, militantly anti safe Harbor, I'm probably not the best person to review the details. Um, and I'm sorry about that, but I, I would, I would read the safe Harbor. It's, there's a, uh, there's a, um, I think it's a notice that has the safe harbor rules in it and they start up when they issue the safe harbor rules because they, you know, we were already well into 2018, but yeah, you should keep track of that. And by the way, I mean, I don't mean to grouse about the safe harbor rule, but the safe harbor rule, um, the, that 250 hour limit includes hours spent by your contractors. So I don't know where in the world you're going to get that information. I mean, if you're going to expect the, 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 the repair guy or the, the kid who mows your lawn to, to um, track those, but I guess, I guess you will. So. Why are you so anti safe harbor? Just curious. Well, because I, I don't think, um, well, first of all, I think like many of these safe harbors, it, um, it is, it is way beyond what Congress required and, and what the treasury regulation writers required, which is, you know, you can, you can hit the, uh, uh, trader business level probably with 10 hours a year, 20 hours a year, 30 hours a year. Again, profitability, continuity, regularity. And so the fact that they created a safe harbor that was 250 hours might be 10 times the hours. That seems just kind of like dirty pool to me. And then mm -hmm. the other problem I have as a tax accountant is, 
if I have an auditor come out and, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but if I have an auditor come out and she or he is thinking safe harbor and, and they've got in their mind, they've, they've now anchored their, their sort of assessment on 250 hours, I may have difficulty convincing them that somebody that, you know, only spends 50 or only spends 100 hours meets the, uh, the, uh, the 162 standard. And yet clearly I can point to a list you know, of, of a dozen court cases where the court is ex accepting those lower hour levels. You, you, know, you don't need to have 250 hours to be a tra be trader business. By the way, just to say this, I mean, there's no 250 hour limit um, when they say you're subject to self-employment tax on, on mm -hmm. consulting income. There, there they say you're in a trader business basically if you make more than 400 bucks. So I, 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 think, that, I think the 250 hour rule safe harbor was, was bad rulemaking. Gotcha, okay, cool. Um, the second persona I'd love to get your thoughts on are, uh, or rather is um, how, like what 199A considerations should a real estate investor be uh, aware of and, and know about if they're a full-time professional real estate investor who doesn't have another day job besides real estate investing. So this might be somebody who has many rental properties, maybe a strip mall or two, et cetera, and their rental income, is that is their business. Yeah, well, that's a good question. So those, those folks are not going to have any problem um, calling their, their thing a qualified business uh, and, and their income qualified business income. So they're going to get the deduction. And I guess the one, the one you know, actionable insight I have for those people is um, we don't know how long this 199A thing is going to be around. It's, um, it's scheduled to sunset in 2025. Um, who knows what, what's going to happen, but um, the, the, the Democratic candidate for president has, has talked about uh, extending the 199A for people that make less than 400 grand, so maybe it'll be around. But because you don't know it's whether it's going to be around or not, uh, and because tax rates are at really pretty low levels, I think if you're a real estate investor, you you um, you allow your income to to be higher these years, and and you don't do things that pull depreciation into these low tax rate years. You keep your you keep your your taxable income and you keep your QBI income big. That gives you a big QBI deduction, and then you sort of save things like depreciation deductions for the future. I, I would not, I would not be inclined to in this. Uh, if you if you can use QBI deductions, I would not be inclined to do cost segregation and put giant depreciation deductions on these year's returns because I figure like, well, I can take the depreciation and save taxes later, probably when rates are higher. Right now, the the opportunity is to have a big QBI deduction. Yeah. Makes sense. There, you wouldn't be able to decelerate depreciation beyond linearly, right? That would be the default if you didn't take advantage of any accelerated methods. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess what, what we see some real estate investors do, and this is sort of a hack, is that, you know, you, you can use cost segregation to, 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 to basically pull a bunch of stuff onto the first year you place something into service. So, you know, I'm just making, making up a number here, but, but if, you bought a, if you bought a condo um, or a, or a this might not a single family home and the building was $275,000. Normally what you do is you depreciate that $275,000 over 27 and a half years. And it would be at the rate of $10,000 a year depreciation. So that would be kind of slow. But if you use cost segregation, you be, you may be able to sort of um, disaggregate that $275,000 into $75,000 of furniture and fixtures and stuff, and then $200,000 of property. And in that case, what you'll be able to do is you may be able to write off that $75,000 in year one. Um, and, and so I, I would not do that kind of stuff now. I guess another, another kind of related comment, and not to chatter on too much about this, but I would be cautious about doing like-kind exchanges now. I would, I, there's a part of me that would, would consider recognizing income now, paying tax on it now, bumping up the basis, and um, and and then having you know ha having lots of basis and having more depreciation for later on. Yeah, that makes sense. I want to come back to the 1031 thing here in a moment, but uh, just to close out on um, the depreciation point. So uh, it sounds like you know because right now, sort of I guess the basic philosophy is a bird in hand is worth more than two in the bush because you know that you know that the deduction is available now. Um, uh, if you uh, don't do cost segregation. Like I can't push my depreciation lower than it would be just with regular depreciation, right? Which is just linear depreciation. Like there's no technique that I have that can push that potentially say to zero for 
like basically pick and choose which years I want to take that appreciate. I can't do that, right? No, you know, you can, I mean, you know, people do do that in air, but you're not supposed to do that. And that would be incorrect. And, you know, I'm not going to say that and you're not going to say that, but you're right. So if, so that $275,000 house, there's no way the lowest number you can do is basically $10,000 a year. Um, yeah. And you can't get, you can't get any lower than that. If I start with linear depreciation, can I later choose to move to cost segregation or is that a one-time thing up front? I have to make that choice right away. Well, you can, you can, you can, you can probably do that and you make an account, you, you basically have a cost segregation study done at some, some point um, down the road and you, 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 you do an accounting method change and fix your depreciation error. So people do that. And, and, and that would, you know, and that might mean that, that in five years or something like that, you, you realize that the, that you're going to stop using just the ten thousand dollars a year on the two seventy five condo or whatever. Gotcha. Okay. And then in terms of like kind exchanges, um, because real estate investors' uh, interaction with one ninety nine A is throttled by this um, fifty percent of wages plus two and a half percent of depreciable basis constraint that you mentioned earlier, uh, when you start to bump up against those phase out thresholds, um, if if I was an investor at the verge of selling property and I had the choice to do a 1031 exchange or just sell it, pay the capital gains taxes and rebuy another property. Um, if I do the 1031 method, is my, is that two and a half percent being deducted from this lower, like the transferred basis? Because that's all I can depreciate going forward if I did a like kind exchange, right? So is my two and a half restricted to that? Or is it on the purchase price, the whole purchase price? Yeah. So, so well, first of all, let me say that that, that the way that the lim the wage based limitation works is that you actually get a choice. Just to go back to something, just to make a, a typo correction here, is that you're you either get twenty percent of QBI, the, the you get the lesser of the following numbers: twenty percent of QBI. T well, actually, let me say tentatively, your QBI deduction is the lesser of one of these three numbers: twenty percent of your QBI or 50% of your wages or 25% of your wages plus two and a half percent of the unadjusted basis of the property. So, so, so that, so the, when you look at the property, um, it's that, that calculation is 25% of wages plus two and a half percent. And, you know, when I think about this, I, I think there is a way to, to kind of wriggle into or weasel into a higher basis number when you do like kind of exchanges, but, um, but, but, but I think that's right. That you may you may find yourself doing things where you um, where you don't you know you don't get the QBI deduction that you wanted to get because your 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 QBI deduction is limited by your adjusted basis. And so you're you know it, it's great that you're not paying. Um, it's great that I mean I, I guess the thing about the like kind of exchange is like kind of exchange. Here's the way to think about it. I think like kind of exchange doesn't reduce your taxes. It just delays your taxes. And so if a like kind exchange means you lose QBI deduction, you have lost, you have lost tax savings. Um, and, and whether the loss of tax savings is compensated for by the deferral benefit would be a question. But I, but I, would, I, would, I would think in many cases, it, you know, those savings are true savings from QBI. So you don't wanna be losing QBI de, um, deductions um, probably. I see, so it sounds like if you are in the bucket that is considering the two and a half percent depreciable basis, the, the textbook way to do it sounds like would be using your adjusted, the transferred basis, but there might be some sort of wiggly things that you can do. Yeah, I think there, but then, yeah, then you might, you might find yourself in tax court where you're having to like defend this. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't think you'd be in tax court, but but yeah, you. I, I think there is. I mean, I I, I had a colleague um, point out to me that that he thought you you read the regs, and and I think he, he thought you could you could um, you could basically kind of weasel your way in to a higher basis number. And I, I I'm sorry, I don't I don't remember the details. It was a it was you know it's it's a 248 page um, sort of recipe set of recipes for how to do this. And I there there is some language in there about like kind of exchanges. And I guess when you're evaluating whether to make this election, you were saying it, because 1031 only lets you defer, it doesn't exempt you from taxes. So the analysis, I, I think if I was a real estate investor, I just want to run this by you as a temperature check. So I would, I would analyze it. I would try to model it out both ways. I would model out the scenario where I, where I just sell the property outright, consider what capital gains I'm paying. That's a, that's a cash outflow uh, versus the QBI I get, that's a cash inflow. 
And I tried to, was the net of that? What's the offset of that? Versus where I do the 1031 exchange and I, um, uh, I guess I don't have to pay taxes right away. I have to maybe have to think about some time value of money considerations when I might actually liquidate that. Or, or if I don't ever plan to, and at, maybe at my death, I get a step up the basis. But then that's gonna be a lower, lower QBI uh, and that's you know forever, at least through 2025, which is the known time period. And then I guess I take a probabilistic um, assessment about the likelihood it's going to survive past 2025. Is that high level the way uh, you would evaluate these two sides? Yeah, I think that's. I think Andrew, I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly what you try and do. And then I think just to underscore something that you referenced, I think you want to. I think you want to think about it. It's it's not for sure. So you'd have to kind of think about it probabilistically or whatever, like, well, what, you know, how, how do I want to weight these things? And then, and then one thing I know, you know, but I'll just mention it because I have an obsessive compulsive personality is it, it might be that rates are higher. And so we may be deferring, we may be avoiding low capital gain rates um, today. And, um, and if we can't, uh, you know, we, we may be paying them later on. And, and by the way, I, I'm not someone who can predict tax law changes. I don't know anybody who can really, but you know, there's also a question about whether they eliminate the step up and basis, uh, the section 1014 rule, which, you know, so, so there's a lot of uncertainty once you start trying to push out very far, which is why I guess I go back to the idea that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to thoughtlessly give up QBI deductions today when it's real money, real saving. Yeah, I guess because like, so, Frankly, I don't know anybody who could really do that, uh, the, this analysis between these two options in a, in a really rigorous way because there's so many variables around um, whether you think the deduction is going to survive or not, what you think tax rates are going to be in the future, your point about is there going to be a step up, in, uh, step up in basis, is that going to continue, you know, unaffected, um, uh, all these things. Um, so, like, I guess... What is one to do in that scenario? You know, because you don't want to make it randomly; it does have real consequences. But it's almost an unknowable answer. Yeah, and 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 I, and I guess that's why I would I would probably err on um, simplicity and and not doing the like kind exchange and 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 take the QBI deduction and and enjoy the QBI savings. Um, and I'm sure the 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 1031 aficionados will if they find a way you know, share with me their displeasure me saying that, but, but, um, but anyway, yeah, that would be the way I would think about it too. Okay, great. So l let me ask a little bit about partnerships. So what are some of the key issues and considerations that owners of professional services partnerships and practices like law firms, accounting firms, medical practices should know about? And I know we talked a little bit about this before they're sort of SSTVs. But I'm just curious, is there like any strategy or technique or scenario where they can avail the 199A deduction even after they exceed the phase out thresholds or are they pretty much out of luck? No, no, they're not out of luck. And, and, and in fact, it's really good to raise this point because there are a couple of things to realize. First of all, many professional service firms um, destroy any possibility of getting a QBI deduction because what they do, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make up a number here, but you've got a guy, man or woman, making $500,000 a year as a physician or a partner in a big law firm. And, and what they do is they extract that money as a guaranteed payment. And then they, then they, and, and some of it is health insurance. And then they have a little bit of a little bit of a box one, what's called distributive share. And the problem is if, if you make $500,000 a year, and by the way, I'm intentionally using a big number because that's when the, the SSTB stuff would kick in. You make $500,000 a year. You might think that, Potentially, you have five hundred thousand dollars a year of possible QBI. But if you pay out, say, four hundred thousand dollars of that as a guaranteed payment, that guaranteed payment is not a QBI. So you really got to. I think I said this early on, and some people thought I was being really aggressive. And then I think everybody else kind of, um, or many other people who'd, who'd been critical thought it worked. Is that I think partnership agreements should have been written in early twenty eighteen to eliminate guaranteed payments and what they should have been replaced with was um, was a, a special allocations and distribution. So you would still pay the $400,000 out to the woman who's the doctor or the woman or the man who's the attorney, but it wouldn't be a guaranteed payment. It would be a, it would be a special allocation and a distribution. So that's, that's, that's critical. And here's the other thing about this is, as I know from personal experience serving these categories of taxpayers, that you'll have partners say something like, well, nobody here is going to get 
QBI deduction because everybody's making way over that, that 426, so it's not relevant to us. We're not going to worry about it. But the problem is, is that there are a number of, and, and you know, all CPAs know this, there are a number of uh, kind of power couples or whatever where you have one spouse who, for example, makes 500 grand. And if the other spouse, because like, for example, they're a real estate investor on paper, quote, loses 200 grand, then suddenly they push their income down below the threshold where SST, SSTB status matters. And so if, if the partnership agreement is written correctly, they'll, they'll get a $60,000 deduction on their return. So that's something else to realize as you're doing this is that, is that you can push your income down to the level where being a specified service trader business doesn't matter. Um, and then I guess one other thing I'll just mention is that a lot of these firms, um, what they're doing is a specified service trader business, but there are also situations where um, you know you you may think of yourself as a lawyer, say, but it may be that you 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 practice law, but you also do continuing legal education, and and if you're doing continuing legal education, and that's kind of a kind of a thing you do, that's probably QBI, even if you practicing law isn't uh, qualified business income activity, and so you need to have your accounting system sophisticated enough that it that it'll basically uh, you know kind of segregate your what they call as separable books if you can if you can break your accounting into kind of the the qbi part of the business and the non qbi part of the business you can find yourself with a, a qbi deduction even if you think of yourself as a lawyer or a doctor or some specified service trader business and that's because the analysis the irs doing is, uh, is doing like like compartmentalizes the in your to just run with your example the continuing legal education uh, service that you're providing is is not considering you SSTV for that purpose. Is that correct? Yeah. So there's a, there's some there's some there's some sort of complicated rules, and and if you only have a little bit of non SSTB activity, um, you ignore it, and if you only have a little bit of um, SSTB activity, you ignore it. And then if you're if it's more significant, what they let you do as long as you can separate this. Um, you should be able to, to break it apart. So another example would be an eyeglass doctor. Well, if you're an optometrist or a, or a um, you know, what, or whatever the eye doctors are called, you're not, you're going to be a specified service trader business. But if you can break out the sale of, you know, prescription lenses, that's, that's not, that's not an SSTB. Hmm. I see. So I think the takeaway I'm, I'm hearing is that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you're in one of the professions that would otherwise be an SSTB, your primary strategy is to try to um, structure your payments in such a way that you are pushed below the phase out thresholds. But in the most optimal case, you're exactly right at the phase out threshold. So you get the full extent, um, but don't, you know, suffer any, I guess, uh, um, uh, from being an SSTV. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. So you want to, to and just maybe set, summarize it or say it more briefly, you want to maximize your qualified business income. You don't want to do things that, that destroy that. And then what you'd like to do is, is just have your income, as you said, just be dropping right down to that level that it, 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 it just starts to matter that you're an SSTB. If you're a part of a partnership, like a law partnership, is the analysis done at the partnership level or at the individual partner level? That's a great question, and it will be done. On, it will be done at the entity level, and um, and then it will be reported on a partner's K one, whether it's a specified service trader business. I see. So it, it is the individual partner who would take the deduction, rather than the partnership trying to do it for all the partners. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And and just to flag this, that's that's something to to kind of take special note of because you, what you don't know if you're the partnership or the partnership you know controller or the partnership tax accountant is you may be thinking that well I don't think any of the guys are going to be able to take this but you don't know that unless you see you know her or his or their tax returns they they may be able to take it even though the K one from the partnership has a big number on it. Okay. If I move to the last category of, um, uh, of taxpayer that I'd love to get your thoughts on, like what are the key issues in consideration that a location independent freelancer, you know, an online slash digital business owner should know about when it comes to 199A? Well, I don't think there's going to be anything, anything, um, you know, particularly challenging about those, those guys. Um, the, 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 you know, an online retailer that's clearly a qualified business there, um, the, the thing that those folks want to do is, is if they, if they, um, you know, if, if they, 
I think S corporations make a lot of sense, and that's sort of a su another subject. But but if they if they if they have a sole proprietorship and they're making under those um, one sixty three if single or under or uh, three twenty six if um, married, they they don't need to worry about anything, and they're just going to get a QBI deduction equal to twenty percent of their business profit. And then if they start to rise above that, they need to be alert that they may need wages. That'll be the thing that'll trip them up if they have their business. Um, uh, explode. By the way, my one tip to people in online businesses is they can explode very, very quickly that, you know, you can be going along kind of not making anything for a few months and things can just absolutely um, go crazy. And so I don't think it's a bad idea to run your business as an LLC, which means it's treated as a sole proprietorship by default. But then you always have the option, even at the last minute, of making it into an S corporation, which might be necessary if suddenly profits explode. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then I would guess I would say for the independent contractor, I would be really careful about how I describe my business. And, and don't default to describing yourself as a consultant. A consultant is an SSTB, potentially. And so if you're doing, if you're a trainer, call yourself a trainer. If you're a, a programmer, call yourself a programmer. If you're an engineer, call yourself an engineer. Don't, and don't, you know, for goodness sakes, don't name your business a consultant if you want to try and take um, a QBI deduction, because that's going to flag your return as, as one that maybe isn't entitled to QBI. And I guess any synonyms of that, like advisory, for example. Yeah, exactly. Consulting, consulting basically is providing advice and counsel or doing political lobbying. So if you, if you describe yourself in that manner, you're going to look like an SSTB, and that will start to matter um, if, you're, if your income gets high. And, and just to um, clarify uh, this point around, once you start to bust the thresholds, if you are in this scenario, you know, you're, a, say, an online or digital business owner or um, a location independent freelancer, and you are having to um, evaluate the 50% uh, the of wages because you're above the phase out thresholds. Um, we're talking like, it has to be an employee wage, right? Well, if I hire a VA or I have subcontractors working for me, that doesn't count. Those payments don't count. Those are business expenses, right? Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, actually one, Andrew, one thing that pops into my head, which of course you're thinking of, and I didn't, I didn't spot or think about it originally, is that it's not just wages. It's wages paid to U.S. Uh, well, first of all, um, it, it's the wages are wages paid to, to U.S. employees, include, includes employees in Puerto Rico. Um, so it's got to be domestic wages. And then the other part of this is location independent. It needs to be um, income earned in the U.S. So if you're if you're a travel blogger and you're really you're really living in Europe, you're not going to get a 199A deduction. I mean, you could if you move back to the U.S., but you you need to have U.S. income and um, and and U.S. wages. This this is I mean that's the other part of this is that what Congress did and, and you can kind of see see their logic in this even if you don't agree is they're going to reward people who are operating businesses in the U.S. and who are paying wages to U.S. workers and and that's what they that's what they want to do and sent sent to happen. But why does it matter where like my domicile is as the principal? Because like the income may be generated in the U.S. Like for example, if I'm a the travel blogger example, maybe all, most of my readers are in the U.S. and all of my affiliate link networks are in the U.S., et cetera. Yeah. So 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 then you're earning the, you're then you're earning the income in the then you are earning the income in the U.S. And so if you're if you're making it in the U.S. paying taxes on in the U.S. that's 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 gonna that's gonna work fine. But but if you were but you're not gonna get um you're not gonna get a one and if you're paying in employees, W-2 employees in the U.S., that's going to be fine. But, but if you were doing something in, you know, you're making money in, um, you, you're, you're, I mean, just making this up, but you're doing, you're a French or you're, you, you, you give uh, French tours, you're, you're an American taxpayer, but you give tours in France, bike tours, and you're making money over there in France. That's not going to be, um, that, that's, that's not going to be um, qualified business income. Okay, got it. So like, I guess on this point, um, two sort of mini scenarios I would love to get your thoughts on. If I'm selling e-commerce, I can pretty clearly prove which sales went to, uh, say, a U.S.-based customer versus a, a non-U.S.-based customer, because I can see where I sent the product to, or maybe I can uh, infer it based on um, their order details. But if I'm running like a travel blog, for example, and I make my money mostly by advertising, something like that, um, how do I prove which portion is U.S. income versus not? Well, I, I think in that case, if you're, if, if you're, I, I think it would be tricky and we have real life situations where this is an issue, but I think if you, if you, like, if you, if you're, if you're operating in the U.S. 
and you're selling stuff in the US and you're selling advertising in the US, it doesn't really matter if some of the people who are buying your products are from, um, are from France or from, or from you know, South America or wh whatever. I mean, you're, you're still earning the money in the US. It, it, you're, the, um, the income is gonna be sourced where you do the work not necessarily where the customer uses the product. So, so you're, you're going to be okay there. And I think you'd have the same thing happen with your, with your, um, with your, uh, with your selling advertising, selling affiliate type stuff off of a website. I think the problem would be, and then clearly if you're, if you're doing tours, like you're literally the tour guide in Europe, then you're, that's clearly European. And I guess the problem would be you're maybe um, living in Europe, um, blog and making money in the U.S. I think that's going to be a little bit murky. And I, I suppose what you might end up doing is you might end up having to source some of your income to the U.S. and um, and and source some of it to you know France or the U.K. or wherever or Argentina, wherever you are. And that and then and then you'd have to you'd have the wages issue too. How how would you have wages in the U.S.? Got it. So it so it sounds like in such a scenario, like I'm just thinking about the scenario of like you know, hypothetical travel blogger who's living in US citizen, but living abroad in, you know, Sydney, Australia, and they, their website is accessible all over the world. They have readers all over the world, some of whom, a lot of whom are in the US, but not all of them. It sounds like there is some segregation work that has to be done. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this and I, and, I, and I guess I don't, I, don't have the, I don't have the details in my head, but there's, there, there's language in the final regs and actually that are, that's in the regs that comes from the statutes where it, where it needs to be U.S. source income and the W-2 wage and the employees are people who, whose wages appear on a W-2 or the Puerto Rican equivalent, that counts. And so I think there, I think there are real problems. I think we advise clients who were, um, who were outside the U.S., to if they really wanted to take the QBI deduction to move back to the U.S., I, that was I'm 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 pretty sure we were advising. We have clients around the world, and I'm pretty sure we were advising people to do that. Gotcha. Okay, great. One last question I wanted to ask before we wrap uh, around policy. So, unless Congress changes the current law, 199A uh, is scheduled to sunset in 2025, which means it goes poof if no action is taken. Um, wh what do you reckon is the likelihood that it would get renewed or extended by Congress? And more broadly, do these kind of tax provisions, which you know, can materially impact how businesses organize and structure their operations generally or often get extended or do they just as often get sunsetted into oblivion? Well, that's a good question. And, and, and I guess I, um, you know, pre-COVID, again, I have a I and every other tax accountant probably has a poor record predicting tax law changes, but but I think pre-COVID, I could have I could have easily believed that um, because this is sort of a crazy tax deduction. I mean, why should in, in a certain sense? I mean, you know, just between us small business people, why should small businesses not have to pay tax on the last twenty percent of their income, which is by the way the highest taxed income they earn? Doesn't really make sense. And so pre-COVID, you could have kind of thought. Well, maybe if we get a new president, and and depending on the the power of uh, balance of power in Congress, maybe they'd maybe they'd think about you know dumping this thing because it doesn't you know there's there's a part of this that I mean I'm a total booster small business, but this there's a part of this that doesn't make any sense. So you kind of think that way, and then you also think yeah, but how much how much fight is Congress going to want to have over this when this whole thing sunsets anyway at the end of 2025? So that was sort of the way I was thinking, and then I was then I was um, surprised, but also you know quite honestly, happy on behalf of my clients that, that uh, candidate Biden had said that he didn't like 199A um, for, for really, really high income people, but he was okay on it up to 400 grand, which, which you know, is actually most small business people. And I know people, people you know, think that there are a lot of people whose income is regularly above 400 grand, but there actually aren't very many people. People have their income spike up, but to average above that level is unusual. And so I, 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 I think there's a possibility 199A could could be around for 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 a long time. I mean, subchapter S, uh, which is kind of similar, has been around since the Eisenhower administration, and, and it's it's kind of a similar, you know, small business loophole that is super attractive and super powerful. All right, great. Well, this has been really helpful, and I guess by the time this episode airs, we will we may already know who the the, the winner of the presidential election is. So this may become less theoretical at that point. Yeah. Um, but uh, We'll see how that lands. Um, uh, Steve, this has been super insightful and, 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 and a lot of fun. Where can people find out more about you and your practice and services? 
I'd say if they go to the blog, Evergreen Small Business, there's lots of information about us and how to contact us. And then, as you mentioned, a whole bunch of information about 199A there. All right. Well, we'll look forward to, we'll link to all that stuff in the show notes and look forward to sharing this with our audience. Uh, I think this will be a good one. And I really appreciate your taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you, Andrew. Cheers. Take care.